Um, and should I talk? Can everyone, everyone can hear me fine, right? Without the microphone, or should I speak into the microphone? Oh, got it. Okay. <laughs> if this is fine, that's, yeah, okay. Awesome. Well, I'm so happy to be here uh, today, and thank you so much for having me and to Supply Frame as well for hosting me. Uh, so today I want to talk about uh, libraries. So I imagine that everyone here has done some circuit board design before. Um, you know, show of hands, has there, is there anyone here that hasn't done circuit board design before and, and maybe like the library space is a little bit new, new for? Okay, so there's a few people. Okay, awesome. So we'll do like a mix of some more simple stuff and then kind of move on to some more of the complex stuff as well. Uh, so what I want to talk about today uh, is the errors that we commonly see at Snap EDA when engineers are building symbols and footprints. And I want to talk about some of the implications that that can have further down the line with your designs. So I'll run through a little bit about why high quality libraries matter. Uh, common symbol and footprint errors that we see both with new engineers but also professional engineers who've already been burned before. Uh, talk about the need for verification in your design flow and then some tools that can help you in your design process. All right, so by the end of this talk, I'm hoping to convey you know, why high qualities matter in your circuit board designs. Uh, again, common mistakes that we see, how you can avoid them, and, uh, and finally, tips and tricks so you can stay focused on building the best electronics possible. As a brief uh, bio, uh, I'm the founder of Snap EDA. It's a website used by a million professional engineers to get the libraries that they need to build their circuit boards. Uh, I started it about five years ago, uh, but I've been working in the PCB design tools and library space for 12 years now. Uh, and I'm from Canada, so I'm an electrical and computer engineer from the University of Toronto. So a lot of the times people ask me, you know, why are you so passionate about libraries? Uh, and I want to give you guys a little bit of a background <laughs> about how I got into this and why I care so much about libraries. And so this is actually the first circuit board I made, and you know, you can kind of see it looks a bit like a NASCAR here. Um, <laughs> and that's because it was actually a collaboration between all these different companies. Um, I was working, working at National Instruments at the time, and we had this you know, ecosystem with all these different companies. So Sunstone, you probably have heard of them. They made the circuit boards. Um, Screaming assembled them. Uh, anyway, long story short, this circuit board uh, was used to demo the circuit board design software that I was working on at the time. And I thought, okay, let's, you know, let's do this really cool demo, which is a very simple accelerometer uh, you know, circuit board made from a reference design. Uh, we hooked it up to this uh, computer that was running in an, uh, an old school Nintendo emulator. And we had data acquisition uh, acquiring the signals of the accelerometer. And uh, so it was really cool because we hooked this inside of a Wii steering wheel and people could play old school Nintendo and you could see the circuit board and it was just really cool. Um, but anyway, long story short, as I started building this circuit board from a reference design, uh, I was so shocked to see that all of the libraries that I needed to build this very simple design didn't exist in my libraries. So the symbols, the footprints, the simulation models. And what happened was a design that should have just taken like you know, a few hours or whatever it was to piece together ended up taking days because I had to make all of these libraries from scratch. And then, on top of that, you start having all these doubts, right? Like, did I make that footprint okay? Like, is this gonna manufacture it properly? Uh, you know, is this gonna cause errors in my design when I, when I go to manufacture it? And so, it was really at that moment that I realized that, you know, there needs to be a, a source of content that engineers can trust um, and that they can use in their designs and they know it will manufacture properly um, so that they can stay focused on actually bringing their ideas to life. You know, we just had this idea, we wanted to make this cool demo for a trade show, and it took us way longer than it should have as a result. And so that's why I'm so passionate about libraries because I really believe that it helps engineers focus on what matters, which is bringing cool and interesting new ideas to life faster um, and not recreating the wheels constantly, um, you know, creating all of these libraries over and over again. So that's a little bit of the motivation of why I care so much about libraries. People always ask me. That is why, and, uh, and we, we're really, at Snappy Day, we're really focused on continually bringing more and more verification, trust, and things like that into the content that we provide. So, <coughs> before we get started, let's define what we're talking about when we talk about libraries. So, as you're going and designing your circuit board, there's 
various stages in the design, uh, the schematic capture where you're capturing your circuit, uh, you might be simulating it as well. You move on to PCB design, and then you might integrate with mechanical and need some 3D models there as well. And so for today's talk, I'd like to focus on the schematic symbols and the PCB footprints aspect, although certainly lots of other types of content have challenges as well, um, but that's where I'll be focusing uh, today. So why do libraries matter? Well, the number one reason is to ensure proper manufacturing. Uh, if you have even the smallest error in, you know, your, um, in the pads on the footprint, uh, that can cause your, the pin to not solder properly onto the board. Um, so, and then you know, pin mapping issues can cause lots of issues with your circuit board design. So really the number one reason is proper manufacturing. The second is uh, for documentation, for consistency and readability. Uh, and then finally, uh, to enable your CAD tool to function properly. Uh, so things like electrical rule checks won't work properly if your pins are not defined properly. Um, so if you label something as an input, but it's a power pin, well, all of a sudden your you know, electrical rule checks are not gonna be doing their jobs properly. So why are libraries so hard to get right? Uh, well, number one is it's an extremely detail-oriented process. Um, you know, right down from even finding the dimensions to use for a particular package and identifying the correct package to use, all the way down to defining, defining all of the pin characteristics. And so that's really one of the biggest reasons why it is so difficult is that there's just so much human, um, or there's just so much potential for human error to play a part. The second reason is uh, lack of data sheet consistency and standards. You guys have probably seen this. Uh, where component manufacturers uh, will do things just totally different, um, you know, across the board. Uh, you know, even within a component manufacturer, there can be lack of consistency in terms of how they do things. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, because all this data is in a PDF file, it's just so difficult to, you know, to get it out in a programmatic way. Uh, lack of standards and uh, industry alignment. Uh, so there are standards that define you know, there's IP IPC standards and there's IEEE standards for some symbols, but there's a lot of stuff where there are no standards around it. Uh, and so, you know, every company, e potentially even every engineer, will do things differently. And then, number four, uh, despite their importance, libraries don't really get all the glamour, they don't really get all the praise, and so uh, I think sometimes they're an oversight. Um, I think a lot of companies, they obviously have good DFM, you know, uh, processes and things like that, but still, libraries uh, are, are often overlooked um, just because they're not the most glamorous thing. So, in terms of standards, uh, there's IPC 7351B, which some of you guys may be familiar with. That defines the land patterns uh, and all the dimensions for uh, dimensioning the, the copper lands. Um, and there's also, I mentioned earlier, IEEE. Uh, there's also the IPC 221B uh, and uh, 2222 <laughs> as well. <laughs> and those define the um, you know, annular rings uh, and so for more for the through hole packages. Uh, so there are standards that do exist. Um, d just out of curiosity, does anyone here use IPC standards in their organizations? Okay, quite a lot of people, so pretty common. Um, now again though, the challenge is that they don't define everything, right? They're not gonna be defining things like, you know, you need to put your pins, you know, in an IC, you need to have your pins, you know, on the left versus the right, or um, they're not gonna de be defining things like silkscreen widths and all these different um, things where there's a lot of preference around with engineers. Uh, <laughs> the other reason this is a hard problem to solve is that the scope is massive <laughs> and Yes, this is intended to look like a IC package. Uh, one of my engineers, <laughs> he, uh, this was his brainchild. Um, and so yeah, there's just so many components, right? There's hundreds of millions of components. Uh, and again, there's no standards for quite a lot of aspects of, of library creation. Um, companies are making their own standards a lot of the time. There's infinite user preferences uh, because everyone has a very strong opinion around libraries. Uh, there's also application specific requirements that people are dealing with. Um, so if they're doing a very dense design or you know, an industrial application that's gonna change the, uh, the dimensioning of the land patterns. 
frequently changing industry standards. So the industry standards change. They're going to change again in just imminently. They're working on the latest version of uh, the IPC um, LAM pattern standard. And so next thing you know, all the dimensions are going to be drastically different. Uh, they're even changing the how you orient footprints and the default orientation. Um, so, and then finally, again, just so many details required for every single pad, every single pin, and that type of thing. And so that's really why this problem is, is very big, uh, and, um, and, and that's why errors do creep in. Now, before <laughs> we start, <laughs> before we start getting into uh, the nitty gritties, um, what I, I just wanted to kind of preface it by saying I'm not going to tell you guys how to build your libraries. Um, there is a lot of personal preference that goes into how to build libraries. What I want to talk about more are errors that, that we've seen that cause manufacturing problems and ones to avoid. Uh, and again, just because a lot of this is about, um, a, lot of, a lot of library standards are around preferences, especially when it comes to things like silkscreen and things like that. All right, so let's start with the very basics. Um, if you guys have done PCB design, I'm sure you've seen these. You may have been burned, hopefully not. Uh, the first one is pin mapping issues. So uh, as you are going, you know, as you're extracting the pin out from the data sheets, um, maybe you, you know, accidentally uh, mapped it incorrectly um, or you missed a pin, but this is definitely um, one of the most common errors uh, that we see. And I think for most engineers, it's the most obvious one that, hey, I need to like triple check my pin mapping. Um, but definitely one that we still see uh, often in terms of, you know, engineers when they're making their own components. So how to avoid it? You know, double or triple check all your connections because this one's one of the easiest ones to avoid. Now that's a very simple component. When you start looking at, you know, 500, 600 pin <laughs> components, yeah, it gets a little bit more, uh, it's a bit more of a burden to, to do that verification. Pad dimensioning errors, so especially when you're doing, you know, if you're, if you're, do, you're doing a simple IC, it's usually not an issue, uh, it's very obvious, but if you're doing uh, some custom pads, uh, very easy to make a mistake on the placement of the pads. Uh, and so this is another one that we see often, and even having, uh, yep? Uh, my favorite is, sub 23 and sub 2.3 look the same. <laughs> <laughs> right. <coughs> and yeah, so this is a very common error, and even having just a small fraction off, um, it's going to cause unreliable uh, manufacturing. So definitely one to keep an eye on. All right, number three, silkscreen too close to pads. So if there's silkscreen silk overlapping the copper, uh, it will cause you know, bad solder joints. And this is something to avoid. IPC specifies um, a clearance to have. Uh, and so this is something that you'll want to watch for as well. This is definitely an error I see with um, a lot of new engineers. Um, because this one, it's, um, it's easy to mistake. Now, I have heard that a lot of PCB manufacturers will, they'll like take away the silk screen. That's something they know to do, but definitely still something to watch to ensure high quality libraries. Okay, wrong outline dimensions. So if you have your component outline wrong or your courtyard wrong, um, that will again cause your tool to not properly check for clearances. And so in this example, um, an engineer accidentally mis mistook a, um, a right angle header for a vertical header, and that affected how the component outline was, uh, was generated, and then because of that, it affected the clearances of the components. And so the components got too close together, um, and the, uh, or sorry, they were too close together, but the tool didn't catch that because of how they defined their component outline. Okay. So those are some of the more, more basic ones. And now I want to go into some of the ones that, um, that we see even with very seasoned professionals who design, you know, have been designing hardware for a very long time, for decades. So this one <laughs> is my favorite. <laughs> and I'm curious, has anyone ever been burned by this one? Okay, lots of people in the room. Okay, this one is the worst. <laughs> because this one happens You've checked everything so in depth, um, and you know you're so sure that your library is perfect, but you've misinterpreted the data sheet. And you know component vendors will play these little tricks on you, <laughs> where um, instead of showing the top view of the component, they show you the bottom view of the component, right? And where typically you're used to seeing it from a top view perspective. 
Now, the other kind of similar error, like this one, is when they have the pin sequencing reversed. So very similar, related, still giving you the top view, but they've just decided to change up the, oh, the pin sequencing. Um, so that's another, that's another one that we see as well. All right, this one <laughs> is another fun one. Uh, and in this case, this is just, you know, this is really just user error um, in, terms of, in terms of interpreting the data sheet. Uh, so in this case, this is something that actually happened on our team recently where uh, you can see here there's just confusion in how uh, to read out that particular dimension. Um, <laughs> and a lot of times these, these drawings, they're just so detailed, right? And so if you look really carefully, you can see, okay, well, you know, that arrow's related to that arrow, right? And so, yeah. Uh, I don't know, I'm even confused just looking at it right now. <laughs> But this is another biggie. Um, a lot of, I think with professional like engineers who've been doing it a long time, a lot of errors do, even, even if they know exactly what to check, it's the data sheet misinterpretation that really can kind of get people. Um, so just really double checking, having another engineer as part of your process, double check, double check how the dimensions were extracted, uh, it's very important. All right, another one is uh, wrong centroid. So you need to make sure your centroid is defined at the center of mass of the component. And uh, I think kind of um, some tools define it as pin one, uh, but that can cause issues with the pick and place machine and can actually add cost to your assembly process. And so making sure that it's at the centroid uh, is important if, um, you know, to make sure that the pick and place machine can do its job. Uh, wrong component zero orientation. So as defined by uh, IPC, it should be top left. That's actually changing in IPC 7351C. Um, <laughs> so you might have to remake your libraries, I don't know. Um, but that's what I mean by the changing standards. The, they're changing constantly uh, and uh, something to keep an eye on as well. Uh, okay, and then improper pin definition. So again, when you're thinking about your electrical rule checks, having the pin types uh, defined properly is really important. And when engineers are making their own libraries, I see this over and over again, where it's just one thing they'll just overlook, but then the electrical rule check um, just doesn't function properly. So that would be something like, you know, mar marking, um, you know, an output as power or whatever, and then, you know, the electrical rule check doesn't find the, the, uh, the error, or does find an error. All right, so, okay. Checklist and verification. So I want to talk a little bit now about how you can avoid some of these errors through uh, different processes of verification, checklists, and having a review process at your company. Um, just real quick, for people that are designing um, you know, their own libraries within the company, do you guys have a process for verifying your libraries? Kind of, yes. <laughs> uh, and is it separate? So actually another question, and maybe we can do like a raise of hands here. Do you guys have a process, um, or sorry, a company managed library and a process to get components into your company managed library? Does anyone? Okay. Working on it. Okay. Yep. <laughs> So yes, and so that's really important. That's something I definitely recommend is, uh, is working with your team to define a process. Um, and so really, no matter where you get the library, whether you create it, whether you get it from a third party website, whether you get it from a component vendor, uh, there needs to be a process to verify that component uh, to make sure that you check everything in detail. It's just so important, and I would highly recommend sitting down with your team formalizing that process. Uh, I can give you an idea of what our process looks like. So. The first thing that we've done is we've defined very detailed verification checklists. Um, so anyone that creates a library on our team goes through these extremely deta detail, um, detailed uh, checklists uh, when they're creating the components. So that's really the first step. Second step is we have an, another engineer that goes through every library that we create and uh, they check each checklist in detail as well. And then finally we have um, automated verification which runs checks through the library as well uh, to try to uncover defects as well. So that's how it looks on our team. Uh, and um, 
just an example of some of the checklists that we follow. Um, we've built this into our, our uh, project management system. So every single engineer, as they're building out libraries, they follow these, um, these processes. And then the other thing we do is uh, every week we get together and we take a look at what issues our verifiers found uh, with libraries. And then we, we think about, okay, how do we improve our processes to avoid this? Um, how do we improve our checklists? And so this is just an example of some of the issues that we found like in the past few weeks. Um, and then our verifier will go in and we'll refine our processes from there. Uh, and then the last thing that is really uh, great mm -hmm. is thinking about, okay, how can we automate this process more and more um, for things like obviously ICs, for headers, for you know RLCs, a lot of the time the process can be automated um, and that's your friend because that reduces the error um, or at least the potential for error. And also uh, when it comes to verification, the more that can be automated is, um, there as well is gonna save you a lot of time. So just real quick, I wanna chat about some of the ways that we're thinking about verification. Actually, the last talk I did with this group, I went through this very in depth. Um, and I wanna just talk about some of the ways we're thinking about solving this. So I, one of the things that we do um, with our automated verification is we compare many different pieces of data uh, as we're creating a, uh, a component, so programmatically. So I wanna give you an example of this. So one example is uh, we work with a component vendor and they provide us with a lot of data. Um, so we were, in this case, we were automating headers for this company and uh, their, the data that they provided to us had inconsistencies. So they said, okay, you know, this header has 24 pins, this one has uh, 18 pins, this one has nine pins. Um, and so what happened was they had been inconsistently marking the total number of pins um, and then sometimes marking the number of pins per row. So for example, they might use that field to say, okay, this is a nine by two header, or they might say this is an 18 pin header. Um, and so in this case, they just said nine, but they meant to say 18. And then in the other field they put, you know, or for the other part they put 24 and they meant to say 24. So long story short, we were automating all these headers and we were like, oh, this is kind of weird because um, how is it possible that it's a two row header that has nine pins, that means 4.5 <laughs> pins per, <laughs> per row. And we're like, that doesn't really make sense. And so <laughs> we started to realize, well, wait a second, here's another source of error in the data that we're using to, to automate the components. And so uh, this is just a very simple example, but what we do is now we say, okay, let's, you know, let's extract data from as many sources as possible to try to understand, is their data even valid? because you can't trust even component vendor data where they're working directly with you know, us as a vendor to help them um, just because it's such a detail-oriented industry that we're in. And so what we do is we now we, go, we reach out to very you know, many different APIs, we weigh the data, and then we flag. If we see any discrepancies, we say, okay, no, we're not automating this part. Um, and we just, you know, we log in and we take a look and we, later on. Um, but that's just a very simple example. Another example of what our checker does is for things like common IC packages that have commonly defined pitches. Uh, you know, if the pitch is off even by a little bit, we'll flag that and say, hey, this doesn't meet, you know, an SOIC is, you know, 1.27 millimeter pitch in general. Um, and, you know, this pitch is a little bit off. Therefore, let's flag that as an error. So introducing more and more um, verification. Uh, for us, that's really important in, uh, in the process. And, and actually, by the way, if you go onto our website, on every part, we expose a small subset of these checks as well. Um, and if you guys upload libraries, you will also see the checks run on your own libraries. All right, so um, yeah, before we actually, before we move on to some tools, uh, I actually want to get everyone's maybe feedback here. Um, I'm curious, were there any, like, are there any errors that you guys have seen that I didn't mention here that might be interesting to, to bring up? Yep. Not so much errors, but one technique that I, that I use whenever I make up a, a new uh, footprint um, is um, I can get my uh, EA middle of 100% uh, scale print out of it, and then I take the physical part and put it on there. Making a place on paper is much cheaper than taking a place on paper. Yeah. 
Yep, that's a great tip. Um, and definitely something I've heard quite a lot of people um, will use that method just to make sure the sizing is good. So that, that's a great point. Yep. Uh, yeah. <laughs> And so, was there, how did you discover that? Like, was it after manufacturing? Oh. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's rough. Um, is there any way that you could have avoided that? Or that you can think of? Or, yeah. Yeah. And, and I, yeah. And ch checking the revision of the data sheet, but I mean, that's, it's like, well, how do you know which one is the latest revision? You know? It's, yeah. Yep. Yeah, I'd say more and more. Um, it's been really great to see the collaboration between um, the companies. So more and more we've been working directly with you know the engineers. And actually the, the data sheet I showed you there was uh, one that came back from a manufacturer where uh, our engineers were working with their engineers. And so as a result, the drawing is being updated. Um, so yes, more and more, uh, I think more and more the component vendors are starting to see that wow, engineers really need this content, they want this content, and it actually helps the component vendors, right? Because we actually take a lot of burden off the component vendors um, in terms of supporting the content. And so yes, more and more we're working directly with them, uh, feeding like back, hey, there's errors here, and they've been very responsive. Um, so the, the connector company, like we fed back, hey, just so you know, all of these, these ones are wrong. And so they're making sure that that's gonna be updated. So we're definitely seeing progress. And also, the really good news is that more and more they're starting to say, hey, um, we're gonna start opening up APIs. We're gonna start releasing data feeds. We're gonna release them on, on people's websites. One really good example is TU Connectivity. Uh, they've made a lot of their data, uh, raw data accessible uh, through their website and available to all of their customers. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and that's and that's like a perfect example of like that's like really the very first step is um, yeah it's okay does the orderable part number match this pa the correct package and the correct package code. Because it might, you know, it might say, oh, this is an SOIC 16, right? And you, you go down to the data sheet package drawing, you're using the SOIC 16, but you don't realize, oh wait, there's a narrow and there's a wide, and you use the wrong one and bam, you know? So <laughs> it's very, yeah, it's very tricky. Um, but yeah, so I wanna go over some, oh, sorry. Oh, I was gonna <laughs> Yep. Well, want different specs on that, and where I've you know had it made you know a hundred runs somewhere and then go somewhere else, then they want something different. How do you I guess deal with that? Yeah. So our system is set up so that we can support in the future like various different um, various different processes because we store all the raw component dimensions. Right now, though, we just build everything to IPC, which is generally like a one to one between the the solder mask, solder paste, and um, and copper, copper top, but that's a great question. It actually, I gave this talk earlier today and that came up as well. And uh, I, you know, it's interesting because if they had defined standards around that, that's something we could support um, and potentially could in the future. Uh, and I think that, so yeah, long story short, we don't support that today. We just support IPC, but it's a, it's a great question. All right.
Okay. So real quick, I want to chat about some tools that may help you in your design process. Um, so Snappy DA, um, if you guys haven't heard about it, it's a free library of symbols, footprints, 3D models. We've started introducing simulation models, um, so Spice, Ibis. Uh, it's still very early, but we started launching some of those with some vendors as well. Uh, and we support all the major design tools in the market. Uh, just out of curiosity, um, yeah, I'm kind of curious what tools you guys use. So if, if you, maybe like who's using Altium? Okay, quite a lot of people. Who's using KiCad? And who's using Eagle? And who's, okay, who's using Cadence? <laughs> who's, okay, just a couple. <laughs> you know, the, the talk I did earlier today, everyone was using Cadence. So uh, it was more, in, it was in South Bay, but it's interesting, yeah. Uh, anyone using Mentor Graphics here? Okay, one person, and any other tools? Fritzing? <laughs> <laughs> and any others? Oh, I haven't heard of that one. Oh, okay. So yeah, so it looks like we cover most of the um, tools in the market here, or that are represented here. Um, again, this is the verification checker I mentioned. Uh, we've just started exposing some of the checks, not all of them, but if you guys want to take a look, it's on every single product page on, uh, that has a CAD model on it. Uh, the other thing that we launched uh, is uh, InstaBuild. This is a computer vision symbol generator uh, where you can build symbols quickly. So basically what it does is you can hover over your pin definitions, it'll extract the pinouts and automatically categorize them. Uh, based on input, output power, it does its best to categorize it. And then based on that, and based on our symbol standards, it automates the symbol as well. Yep. So it's like grabbing graphic images and OCRing them from PDF? That's exciting. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, yeah. So yeah, you just hover it. Uh, it's using OCR and uh, some very simple computer vision as well. Uh, and yeah, and then it, it extracts it and then auto-generates the symbol. So, so give it a try. It's still in beta, but give it a try. Um, and then the other thing is Instapart. So this is something that's really popular. It's growing in popularity. If we don't have a part, you can request it. You get it in 24 hours, and then it becomes free for everyone that uses our library to benefit from as well. And then you get a notification the next day that it's live. <laughs> yeah, any part. Uh, so yeah, any part. Yeah, so it's, uh, sorry, under 100 pins. <laughs> and if it's over 100 pins, then we have like a per 150 pin kind of pricing, extra credit. So basically it's a credit, credit model. So just to summarize, libraries are necessary for reliable manufacturing, readability, ERC checks, um, and other features in your CAD tool. Uh, implementing verification checklists and processes uh, are it's essential. I definitely recommend creating a uh, a company library where you guys are and having a process to vet the components before they get into your library because then you can reuse it on future designs with the trust that this is good, this is a good quality library. Uh, and other tools can help increase your efficiency and productivity as well. Uh, and before I wrap up, I want to thank some of my team members who helped me with this presentation. It's our team, um, our CAD manager at the top. And yeah, does anyone have uh, any other questions? <laughs> yep. Do you mean like 3D step models or like? So that's a great idea in theory. <laughs> Where it kind of breaks down is that a lot of the time, peop engineers have been very lazy with package models. They could be, and there's a reason for this, right? Because the more complexity that you model, the bigger the file size gets. Um, so we typically don't um, verify with those just because of that reason. Um, a lot of the tolerances aren't taking, taken into account. Uh, and so it's just not the most, um, I think it can give you like an overall, it would be similar to, I think, the other recommendation of printing out the piece of paper. So I think it's a good way to check the general size. Um, but I think in terms of more accurate verification, uh, because of the lack of detail, um, it's, personally, we don't, we don't do that, but it's a great in terms of general sizing, for sure. You can basically put in place a system for verifying components before they go into our library. Yep. Do you have a recommendation for how to go about constructing such a system? Have you 
seen ones that you like that people use? I mean, so we've created our own kind of system for this. Uh, and I mean, I think you can go along with, with checklists. But I think the problem there, and really the hardest part of it, is enforcing people to actually follow them. That is really the hardest part. So if you can, what we've done is we've taken, like we, we use Trello. Uh, we've added like with Zapier a bunch of automation to add checklists to different stages of the process. Um, and so nothing can even be released until someone has literally like, you know, going up here until, s whoop, oh, there we go. <laughs> until someone has actually like said, okay, I have done this. Um, we're working on baking this more into our whole upload process as well. Um, but I think, yeah, you know, it's probably a little bit of overkill if you're just focused on hardware to write custom software for this. So I'd say, I'd even say like paper checklists. I've seen companies doing that and at least it just enforces the discipline around like I have checked this, you know. Um, I've seen some people, they have to sign off on it, some companies. Uh, and I think that's really important because it's, ju it's just, you know, this is going to cost you a lot of money if you get it wrong, so. Mm -hmm. So, like, to me, that just sounds completely, like, like bonkers. Like, how do you handle a standard changing so drastically, which sounds like, you know, relatively often, and, like, do people just ignore the standard for that reason? Like, how, how is that, how do you deal with that? Like, they're trying to make all these libraries. Yeah, so luckily it doesn't change. Like, it's not, like, changing every year, thankfully. Uh, but we just, we basically just had to architect our system such that instead of storing the, like, raw dimension data of like, we store the, sorry, we store the, the, com the dimension data, right, of the component, um, not the actual data of the completed model, if that makes sense, because it's a transformation between the pin dimensions and the completed model, um, and it's the standard that defines that transformation, uh, right? So that way, we can at any point introduce a new standard, we can even keep the old standard on there, um, but it's, it's definitely a great question because that is one of the, the biggest reasons that, you know, I created this um, in the first place was because they do change, um, they do change relatively often and there needs to be a dynamic system, even file formats change really often. So KiCad just released KiCad 5 and uh, when they released that, uh, the old way we did things, we had to update it and yeah, so. It's like a moving target. It's, it is a moving target and that's why it's the way it ne is architected it needs to be such that um, that it can be dynamically generated, like the content can be dynamically generated. So, all right. Um, yep. You also maintain uh, things like uh, pad libraries, view libraries, that kind of stuff? We don't, not current. Yeah, we don't. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much. <laughs>so this is usually the time where we open up the floor to anyone who has questions or wants to anybody have any announcements or anything you have a demo oh yeah we're doing demos too it doesn't say after we have an announcement okay Right. Uh, thank you guys for putting this on. This is an awesome event. My background is actually in aerospace engineering. Uh, and I just want to say that our company, Astronus, we're right down the street. We build microsatellites to put up uh, low cost bandwidth on demand uh, right where it's needed. So we are very excited to say we just announced our first customer. We're putting up a, a dedicated satellite for the state of Alaska. Uh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> And it turns out that just with this one microsatellite, we'll be able to triple the amount of bandwidth to the people in Alaska, where it's just a pretty dire situation, actually. Like, they really are paying absurd prices. I mean, people there pay like $300 a month for five megabits a second internet speeds, things like that. So uh, we are hiring, uh, especially electrical engineers. It's a really challenging set 
of problems. We're building satellites for uh, so these satellites.